Against all odds, the Ruger Mini 14 refuses to die. It's dated and expensive, but it's still in production today and it remains popular with a lot of shooters. In part one, we looked at the history of this rifle and we ended with the question, what can a Mini 14 do that a scary black rifle cannot? And the answer is not much really, at least not from a purely functional standpoint. The Mini 14 is less versatile, it's less accurate, less reliable than a halfway decent AR or AK or any number of other semi-automatic rifles. The benefits of the Mini are mostly intangible. If you're buying one today, it's probably for one of two reasons, legality or aesthetics. There are a few states, I think we're up to eight now, where AR-15s and similar rifles are either banned or very heavily restricted. Most of these laws try to regulate guns based on certain features like pistol grips and adjustable stocks. The basic Mini 14 without the flash hider does not have any of the banned features, so it's still legal in all 50 states. For now, I think. Don't take my word for that. Those states also have magazine capacity limits, so in most cases, you're stuck with 10 round mags. But considering the other options in the banned states, the Mini 14 is a decent rifle. You can make it work. There are guys in California, for example, who I'm sure know more than anybody else about how to tweak and optimize the Mini to get the most out of it, just because that's all they've had to work with for a long time. Sales from the banned states alone could probably keep the Mini 14 in production for a long time, but that's not the only reason people like the Mini. Outside of the banned states, aesthetics is probably the driving factor behind most Mini 14 sales today. And by aesthetics, I don't just mean that they like the way the gun looks, although that is a big part of it for some people. It evokes nostalgia for World War II era rifles, or maybe for corny action TV series from the 80s. The main aesthetic appeal is that it's not an AR-15. I could list dozens of reasons why the Mini is functionally inferior to the AR, and we are gonna talk about some of those in a minute, but the fact that it's not an AR is exactly why a lot of people are drawn to it. Maybe they're just bored with ARs and they want to add something different to their collection. Others are concerned about how an AR-15 would be perceived if they ever had to use it in self-defense. The Mini 14 doesn't have the same image problem among the general public that the AR-15 does. Even among gun owners, there are some negative stereotypes associated with the AR-15. I have noticed this especially with uh, newer shooters or some shooters who don't personally know many people who own ARs. They might associate the AR with like guys who try to look like combat vets and call everybody brother, or the high-end gear snobs, or the people who don't really shoot, but they buy an AR solely to make a political statement. I think it's easy for shooters who don't have a ton of experience with the rifle itself to feel like buying an AR would mean that they're joining one of those stereotypes. For those shooters, the Mini 14 is the anti-tactical rifle that can still do tactical kind of stuff if they want it to. It should be no surprise to any of our regular viewers that I personally appreciate the desire to just be a regular person who owns guns rather than embrace the so-called armed lifestyle that comes with a predetermined wardrobe and personality. The trouble is, if you expect a Mini 14 to perform like an AR, except with a friendly looking wood stock, you're gonna be disappointed. The Mini has a bunch of what I would call minor shortcomings that I could personally overlook if it wasn't for the bigger ones. The magazines seem expensive, but that's only because we're used to AR mags being dirt cheap. The 20 round Ruger factory mags cost about what I'm paying for most pistol magazines. Mounting optics is not nearly as much of a chore as it used to be. A few companies like Ultimac and Amiga make optic rails that replace the factory handguard. This one is from Samson Manufacturing. Uh, we wanted it in black, but we couldn't find it in stock anywhere. This gray one would go really well with a stainless mini. It's got this flat spot on the rear where you can direct mount a micro red dot optic. That gets the optic nice and low, so you get a full cheek weld, and depending on the optic, co-witness with the iron sights. 
It also has spots on the side here where you can mount other accessories like this cutie sling swivel and a white light. And that takes care of another couple of nitpicks that a lot of people have with the Mini. I'm not aware of any way to improve the manual safety. It's in a less than ideal location. It really invites you to stick your finger in the trigger guard before it should be there. But even that is something I could learn to live with. There are two much bigger issues that make it really difficult for me to embrace the Mini 14 for anything other than a range toy. They're the ones I mentioned at the beginning, accuracy and reliability. This is a brand new Mini 14 that we bought just a few weeks ago. We have not done anything to it except try a couple of different stocks and add this optic rail. No modifications to the action or the trigger or anything internal. We've run about 700 rounds through the gun. It was lubed several times and cleaned uh, once about halfway through. It has had numerous stoppages throughout our testing, regardless of which stock we were using or whether the rail was mounted. Nothing really serious like uh, parts breakage, but about half a dozen times the bolt locked open while there were still rounds in the magazine. On a couple of occasions, the bolt cycled, but failed to pick up a round from the mag. So I got a click when I pulled the trigger and I had one really ugly failure to eject. It comes down to roughly one malfunction for every 70 rounds fired. And that's just not up to par for a modern semi-automatic rifle. Based on the feedback we got from part one, this kind of experience is not unique. Some of you said that you like your Mini because it is reliable, but we heard from just as many people who have sold theirs or just stopped shooting it because they couldn't get it to run. The Mini 14's problems with accuracy are almost legendary by now. The newer rifles are on average more accurate than the ones made before about the mid 2000s, but accuracy is still an issue and it seems to be inconsistent from one gun to the next. We tried a few different match grade loads through this rifle at 100 yards. The best groups came from the Winchester USA Ready 62 grain open tip. We got 2.2 and 2.7 inches, but the other two groups we fired with that same load were six and 6.7 inches. With every load, most groups had at least one or two flyers. There was just no way to predict what the gun was gonna do. I don't think I'm holding this gun to an unrealistic standard. Most of us don't need sub MOA accuracy for most of the things that we're gonna do with a rifle. Two to three MOA will probably get the job done, but six to seven MOA is just bad. Now I've heard people dismiss the accuracy problem by saying that like the average shooter is not as accurate as the gun anyway, so it doesn't really matter. You know, that argument has never made any sense to me. An inaccurate rifle is not canceled out by a mediocre shooter. If a shooter is capable of six MOA accuracy and you give him a gun that's capable of six MOA, he's now a 12 MOA shooter. He's twice as bad. I could walk into any gun store, at least outside of a banned state, and choose at random any other new rifle chambered for 5.56 and it's almost guaranteed to be capable of better than 6 MOA accuracy, especially if that rifle costs as much as this Mini 14. If you need to use your rifle for anything practical at all, or if you just enjoy hitting what you aim at, it's really hard to justify a 6 MOA $1,000 rifle in the year 2022. I do want to give credit where it's due. So there is at least one area where the Mini is objectively superior to the AR-15, and that is the lack of a buffer tube. That gives us a couple of advantages. The first is the lack of mechanical offset or height over bore. You probably know what this is, but in case you don't, uh, the buffer tube on an AR places the stock right in line with the bore. So in order for the sights to be up in line with your eye, they have to be an inch or two higher than the rest of the gun. This isn't really a problem except at close range. Out to about 15 yards, you gotta remember to aim a little bit higher than the spot you wanna hit because your shots are gonna go a little lower than where you're aiming. On the Mini 14, there is a little bit of offset, but the stock is lower than the line of the bore, so the sights can be really close to the barrel and offset is not nearly as much of a problem. 
Now a couple of inches of offset doesn't really make much difference if my target is something like this Ipsic target and I'm aiming for the center at 10 yards. Even if I forget to compensate for the mechanical offset, I'll still get decent hits. It's more of an issue if I'm going for something smaller like the head box. But even then, I'm on the target just a little low. Realistically, where offset tends to become more of an issue is when shooting around cover or obstacles or some kind of improvised rest. If I were to aim around this barricade, as far as I can see, it looks like I've got a clear shot to the target. But obviously, if I fire, I'm gonna hit the barricade. Offset is something you have to train a lot to remember. It's easy to learn, but a hard thing to remember. It's just not as much of an issue with guns like shotguns or lever actions or bolt actions or the Mini 14. The other perk to not having a buffer tube is that you can add a folding stock like the ATM stock we have here, which is also from Samson Manufacturing. Except for a couple of minor improvements, it's a perfect replica of the Ruger factory folding stock from the 1980s. There's a little release button right here on the hinge, lets you swing the stock in like that, and then you just press this little lock button on the back of the butt plate, and that locks into this little stud here on the stock. And now the uh, stock is locked in place so it won't swing out on its own. You can shoot with the gun folded if you want, or you can just press the lock button again and swing it back out and shoot it in the open position. The stock is surprisingly comfortable to use. The cheek weld is decent. It's uh, got a 13 and a half inch length of pull, which I find to be a little on the long side, but that's the same as the Ruger factory stock. I tried firing from some awkward positions with the VTAC barricade, and it was a little tougher than using the traditional stock, but not horrible. For normal shooting positions, it's not bad at all. It's even got a slot over here where you can put a sling swivel. With the stock folded, the overall length is 27 and a half inches. Uh, that's with the 18 and a half inch barrel. The mini with the 16 and a half inch barrel and flash hider would be about an inch shorter. Uh, so we're not looking at like a backpack sized gun here, but the folding stock does make it a little easier to store or maneuver around inside your battle van. Of course, there are other rifles with folding stocks if that feature is important to you. It's always been an option for AKs. Now we even have ARs with folding buffer tubes and several AR style carbines with no buffer tube at all. So this really just comes back to aesthetics. The main appeal here is the cool factor. As a huge fan of the M1 carbine, you might think that I'd also be fond of the Mini 14. They have a lot of similar qualities, including some of the same flaws. But the M1 carbine is more than a pound and a half lighter, it's a little softer shooting, it's not as loud, and it's slightly more accurate. I don't hold the M1 carbine to the same standard as the Mini 14 anyway. If I owned a vintage muscle car, I wouldn't expect it to have the same gas mileage or reliability as a modern daily driver. I don't think the Mini 14 is a very good daily driver kind of rifle. If you're looking for something that you can use for personal protection or hunting or competition, the Mini 14 leaves a lot to be desired. But it doesn't really matter what I think. The Mini 14 is not dead and doesn't look like it's gonna die anytime soon. A lot of people really like this rifle. Some people have had to learn to like it because they don't have many other choices. Other people like it for reasons that defy logic and practicality. Like I always say, as long as you can use the gun safely and you understand its limitations, just like the gun you wanna like, buy the gun you wanna buy and have fun. Guys, I hope you have enjoyed this two-part series on the Ruger Mini 14. A big thanks to everyone who has hit that like button and subscribed to our channel, and an extra huge thanks to all of our customers. I don't know where the rest of you are getting your ammo, but I pity the fool who doesn't get it from us with lightning fast shipping at LuckyGunner.com. <laughs> Bye.